okay? On this throwing category, passing and shooting are both encompassed, okay? Passing, there's no difference, there's no difference. Shooting is throwing harder. All right, we want to simplify it as, as coaches and, and definitely simplify it for these kids too. They don't need to have all these different forms and techniques from passing to, to shooting. It's the same thing. If you can throw a ball, you could do it harder and there's your shot. Okay? So I have four different categories of throwing laid out for us. The first one is what most coaches teach right away, which would be set okay, or time and room. So for a righty, what that means is, okay, have your left foot in front. Right, point your toe, point your butt end. Right, a lot of different coaching cues that you can have here. A lot of coaches are preaching to their kids to get their hands up and away. All right, I have some strong opinions on that, which we'll go, we'll get to in a second. But I just want you to consider the footwork first. You don't need to have your left foot in front when you throw righty, and I would actually argue that that's bad advice because if you always have kids that need their left foot in front when they throw righty, what are they going to do when they're running full speed? Right, they're going to have trouble. So we want to set them up for success in all these different situations that they're going to encounter, particularly on the run, okay? So for set throwing righty, we have our left foot in front. For on the run throwing righty, our right foot will be in front, okay? So by the time they're throwing on the run, that right foot will be the one that planted most recently. So we want to get them practicing that. So you're doing stick work with your kids. Don't just have the left foot in front. Practice playing partner passing and all these different drills with having the right foot in front as well. All right. The next type of throwing is a jump throw. All right. You might, might have heard of a jump shot. This isn't something that needs to be worked on, but, but you could definitely consider what, what it would look like. And I think this actually is very, very beneficial for the young guys because it just turns into a balance drill. So if I'm going to work on jump throwing, I'm going to balance on my left foot. This is for righty. Balance on my left foot. I'm going to pivot and throw. So you could just think of that as a balance drill. You don't need to cue them on, oh, this is your jump shot and stuff like that. Just balance on one foot and throw. And then lastly, in this throwing category, we have our inside finishing. All that's going to really mean is don't let your hands be too close together, all right, and try to practice faking with pump fake cradles, all right. When you're teaching pump fake cradles, in my opinion, one of the top priorities is keeping the stick behind your head. So by coming in front and then back, that time it takes me to bring it back is, is the recoil time. You know, if I'm trying to fake out a goalie, that's more time for them to react. So my pump fakes should be behind my head and I can fake high and fake low just by leaning, right, and keeping this stick really, really close to my ear. In this throwing category, all right, this is important. So I mentioned having the hands out and away from your body and that's a, it's one of the most common coaching cues you hear. It's not a bad thing to have your hands out and away from your body, but it can be in a lot of situations. If you're running around like this, that probably isn't good, right? You want to stay protected. So I have something that I call the extension spectrum, right? All that means is if I were to have one end of the extension spectrum is no extension. If I were to have no extension as a righty, what that's going to mean is my elbow is completely tucked to my rib. So if I'm aiming for the top right corner right now, right, my stick should be pointed at that. My bottom hand elbow, my left elbow is up, right, but my top hand is not up and away from my body at all, right? The key is that I have a proper grip, right? The other end of that would be full extension. So now I'm going to completely lock out my right elbow and work on throwing from out here. The issue that I see a lot of times when coaches are teaching their kids to get their hands out and away is they get their hands out and away and they're like, look coach, I did it. But then they throw and the hands just come in and they push. Right? So what was the point of being way out here if we're just going to drop to here and throw from here? Right? So when you're teaching that extension where they're keeping their hands out and away, right, there should be more of a rainbow motion to that throw right, where the stick comes way up and over as opposed to down and through. Okay? Two more things here. I have symmetry here. I'm going to finish on that. One thing I did not write down on this whiteboard is triple threat. So this is, in my opinion, one of the first things that I would teach a group of young uh, lacrosse players. Triple threat position starts with the grip, right, and having a vertical stick. So similar to a basketball concept, triple threat in basketball is you're ready to pass, you're ready to shoot, and you're ready to dribble. In lacrosse, it would be I'm ready to pass, I'm ready to set up my shot, and I'm also ready to dodge. Okay, so I might have my stick face pointed away. All right, in this triple threat position, my head's up, Right? and I'm ready to move. So one of the simple drills that I'll try to do to incorporate this is once I teach everyone 
to, to stand like this is I'll start, I'll have everyone on the line, I'll start having everyone run, stop, back pedal, shuffle left, shuffle right, all on my audio cues. And their goal is to try to maintain triple threat position and you can cradle within this, right? So one thing we really didn't talk about was cradling, right? If you put a stick in a kid's hands, in anyone's hands, they're naturally gonna hold it like this because this is easy. It's easy to hold like this, right? But you watch the game, you, you, know, you listen to coaches, you're gonna hear, you know, don't have your stick down here, have your stick vertical, right? Because you can't really throw good passes from here and it's much easier for someone to check my stick. So when we talk about cradling, I wanna get used to cradling up here in this triple threat, what I would consider vertical position, all right? And so this would be one of the simple cradles we'd wanna get good at while running around. The other one would be this face cradle having it come all the way across my face. And this is a great one to be practicing when you're in tight spaces, all right? So that triple threat position is huge. And then lastly, on this fundamental skills category is symmetry, okay? We do not need our kids to be perfectly symmetrical, all right? If we think that they're gonna be able to throw lefty and throw righty to the same level of execution, it's a totally ridiculous ask, all right? Instead, what we should be focusing on is having more dynamic players on their strong hand, right? AKA having a couple different things they can do. Maybe it's overhand, sidearm, underhand, and behind the back, right? There's no reason they shouldn't be trying these things at least. But when we go to our weak hand, we're gonna be focused on doing one thing really well, okay? An overhand, be able to throw a set shot overhand, a set throw overhand, and an on the run overhand in our weak side, and that's it. Okay, so we do wanna focus on that weak hand and have them have the ability to go there with confidence, but we don't need to be symmetrical, right? Uh, especially when we're going into season and you guys have that you know, beginning phase where you know, what are we really trying to accomplish at the start so we can go into game one feeling like we have some uh, confidence as individuals and as a group, right? We don't need to have kids that are attacking their defender in their weak hand to set up their strong hand. Right? I would argue that's a bad piece of advice, right? because if I'm attacking a defender in my weak hand, I'm already in my own head. Right? I'm gonna to start to question myself. Instead, I could just stay in my strong hand, pretend to go to my weak, and then go to my strong. Right? That's gonna be a lot more effective and they're gonna feel a lot more comfortable you know, knowing their coach is behind them in prioritizing, spending more time in their strong hand. Right? They should be catching in their strong hand, they should be scooping in their strong hand, but they should practice going to their weak hand and feeling confident making a play on that side of their body. The best players in the world kicking things off here. What a, an amazing setting with Gillette as the backdrop. Over the last decade, Gillette Stadium has become known as the premier destination in professional sports. To be you know, in a really special lacrosse community in, in Massachusetts and outside of Boston, there'll be all sorts of emotions going into that weekend. To walk into Gillette for opening weekend, I mean, that, that is as professional as it gets. Okay, moving right along here. Our practice plan template is something that I want you to just consider to, to prioritize your time that you have together with your team. And here's something that I would look at to break the timing up, okay? So I have these three phases. You have your intro phase where we're gonna be in one big group. So ideally the head coach would be facilitating this part and the other coaches that are available are going to be making sure, you know, doing their best to make sure everyone is paying attention and everyone is doing what they're supposed to be doing, but we can all be doing the same drill. Usually that's gonna be some sort of a stick work uh, drill, whether it's, uh, you know, star passing, line drills, partner passing, a lot of different drills that we could, you know, work on having everybody doing at once, but everyone would be performing the same drill and the coaches we have available are then going to facilitate that as best that we can. All right, from this intro section, let's say we have somewhere between 75 minutes and 90 minutes for a practice plan. This is probably 15 to 20 minutes, right? Our intro, everyone, some kids are showing up late. You know, we can start that drill as kids show up and get them going as they're, uh, they're all geared up. And then once everybody's dialed into that drill, maybe we focus on picking up the intensity, then we'll move on to this next phase, all right? We're all familiar with station work, all right? The, the biggest mistakes that I see that we want to sort of focus on preemptively is having the coaches know what station that they're going to do and giving them a few minutes to set up whatever cones they need to before we break off from this first phase. 
So as phase two starts, AKA, you know, we give everyone a water break, the, a double whistle blows so they know that we're changing gears. Coaches are already setting up their stations so that as we break athletes up into groups, they have a little, the coaches have a little bit of a heads up to prepare themselves. So depending how many coaches you have and depending how big your group is for practice, somewhere between two and four groups is ideal. And the timing of this is key. So I have here 10 to 15 minute rotations. Anything less, it's really hard. Anything less than 10 minutes, it's really hard to like start getting momentum with the drill. And anything more than 15 minutes, uh, the athletes start to burn out. It's, it's tough to keep their attention for that long. So 10 to 15 minutes stations, all right? And I would say it's really beneficial to have one coach, maybe it's the head coach, be strictly dedicated to the facilitation of rotations. Instead of actually coaching a station, he's going to then make sure that everybody is set up and maybe one station needs that coach's attention more than another. And he can, of course, give that, but their primary role is to facilitate making sure everything is up and running and giving coaches a heads up, hey guys, we're halfway through this station, you know, be ready to start closing things up in a couple minutes. All right, so two to four groups. There's a lot of flexibility here um, with having everybody go through once for every station or twice, okay? Uh, recently, I ran a practice for a group of 40 kids and we had three coaches. So for that particular practice plan, we had two groups, two groups of 20, and we ran 10 minute stations, but each coach had two drills ready to go. So they saw the same group twice, and when that first group that they started with came back the second time, there was a progression of that drill that they were ready to implement. So instead of trying to say, okay, we've got you know, two coaches and 40 minutes to kill, let's do two 20 minute stations, having four 10 minute stations can be very, very advantageous uh, to make sure that the attention spans of the kids is um, staying on you know, what, we, what we wanted on. And then lastly, right, always have a finisher drill ready to go. So this is where we'd have everybody come back together as one big group. A finisher could be a scrimmage, a finisher could be a relay race. There's a lot of different things we can do there and I'll go over one or two of those in just a minute. But by having everybody finish together, that's our opportunity to finish practice on a high note, right, and have these kids start to build chemistry. When we're doing our station work, there's a lot of different factors at play, such as are you gonna break kids up by skill, right? Or are you gonna break kids up by team, where we have some advanced players with some uh, you know, less experienced players? Uh, there's no right and wrong answer, and I think you should try both. And there's strategies to try to maximize um, how you would change your coaching cadence based on how you broke those groups up. But regardless, by finishing with something fun, we can use that as an incentive during station work, meaning, hey guys, if you pay attention and we could really focus on getting some momentum with this drill, we're gonna have more time to play that fun game at the end, right? They always wanna play a game at the end regardless, so we might as well play to that and use that as an incentive to garner more attention during station work. Lastly, particularly for these young guys, we wanna try to gamify everything, okay? So starting from stick work, right, one of the simplest ways you can start to gamify that is by having challenges with a stopwatch. So using your phone or whatever, if you have a stopwatch, you know, hey guys, how many can you get in 30 seconds? Ready, right? And having everybody in line with that sense of urgency, that timing things adds to the equation. So there's, there's one way, right, by simply adding a timed challenge. Two is to try to make the drill itself a little bit more challenging. So one thing I've tried and, and found some success with, even with these younger ages, is practicing partner passing where both athletes have a ball, right? So they're gonna make eye contact and at the same time, they're both gonna throw a ball and then catch. So it turns it into this thing that they've never tried before, but you'd actually be very, very surprised at how well they can get at, um, at this, even at that first and second grade level. It's something that maybe we don't expect it to look great, but even just by trying it, right, we're adding that sense of urgency and it, and it garners their attention into the task at hand which is one of the keys here. All right, we wanna to try to gamify everything. So what I have here, right, is a drill, uh, a scrimmage style drill that is predicated upon creating an environment, right, that is going to give them the opportunity to learn the most important skills. So 
I call this Laxol. I just made it up, basically a, a play on futsal, how it's a, a shrunken down version of soccer. This is a shrunken down version of lacrosse. The two main rules that I have at play here, right, is the three second rule and a scoring zone. So the three second rule is basically as soon as they either scoop it or catch it, there is a three second shot, uh, clock that the referee or coach is going to implement. And if they have that ball on their stick for four seconds, that's a turnover, right? And this promotes one of the hardest skills to teach, in my opinion, uh, especially at the youth level, which is off ball movement, right? When these kids have the ball on their stick and someone's trying to take it from them, it's pretty obvious that they should start moving, right? But it's all the other kids that are standing around that are unsure of, uh, you know, where they should go and how often they should cut and things like that. When we implement a rule like this, the three second rule, it really does work almost like magic where I see kids start to get worried that their teammate you know, won't have anyone that's open. So they really work hard to try to make themselves available. And we're instilling these habits right, that would be extremely valuable for them to continue to, to utilize. The second rule here is this scoring zone. So this is an option that you can add in. You can make this line with cones. This depends on whether you have goalies or not at practice and this depends on uh, the nets that you're working with. So if these are lacrosse nets and we have goalies in cage, you don't necessarily need to use this. But I know a lot of the youth programs don't have goalies at every practice and maybe they rotate uh, who you know, has to play goalie for the game but they don't actually want to at practice. So you don't need goalies for this game because you can utilize this scoring zone. And all this means is that you cannot shoot unless you are inside of the scoring zone, right? So this, this type of game promotes up and down play, two-way play, everybody plays O, everybody plays D, there's no offsides per se. So you can feel confident stepping up field and not worrying that you, know, you don't have anyone staying back and, and playing goalie because if the other team picks this ball up, they can't shoot on an empty net unless they run and get into this, their own scoring zone, which should give us time you know, defensively to then get back and have someone play goalie, AKA you're gonna play with a tennis ball, right? And this is great for mini nets. So if you have the four by four nets or you've got a trash barrel that you can tip on its side, right? These are great options to get these, uh, these games happening with smaller sided goals, making it more challenging for the kids to score. And the tennis ball, of course, is working on a lot of skills. Most kids, especially at that age, will give you a ton of pushback. You'll say, we're gonna play this game with a tennis ball. They're excited to play a game, but they realize how hard it is to catch and cradle and throw with a tennis ball and run around. The ball's gonna be falling all over the place to start. And our coaching cue there is to try to let them understand that if you can do this with a, with a tennis ball, it's only gonna get easier with a real ball, right? And try to incentivize them to, to focus on that challenging part of it um, because there's gonna be long-term benefit. But this is something that I use all of the time. Sometimes I'll even use this as a station, but it's great for a finisher drill because obviously kids want to finish with a game, something that's fun and competitive. And I found this to be extremely helpful. So if you guys have questions about any of what we went over in this video, please feel free to reach out. Myself and the MBYLL are here as a resource for you guys. Obviously we're in a, uh, interesting circumstance at this point in time, but we're gonna to try to do our best to provide as much value and resources to you guys so that when we do kick the season off, we can hit the ground running.